going to be going to look at Romans again, chapter 5. And last week we studied downstairs, the told us weren't here. Last, last time we looked at verses 7 and 8 and talked about the what's called the doctrine of substitution, or in more plain words, Christ dying in our stead. Amen. We looked at how that's really the ultimate display of God's love towards us. But here Paul in verses 9 and 10 are just going to continue to build upon that same thought. Many people stop their substitution and don't think about any more of it, but yet there's so much more that Christ has done for us than just dying in our place. Amen. So here Paul begins to bring him out in verse 9. <clears throat> he says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath from him. Amen. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Here he begins in verse 9 by saying, much more than, for not only did Christ die for us, but we have all this here as well. You know, it, if just Christ had died for us, certainly the, the penalty for sin would have been removed. But he did so much more for us. He's given us so much more than just that. Mm -hmm. In fact, we'll see as we go through these two verses that if only Christ had died, then we would not have the full effect of salvation. Mm -hmm. But that's where it begins with Christ dying in our place, him being our substitute. But it goes on to say, much more than being now justified by his blood. Well, because we have been justified, we remember justification is being declared innocent or being acquitted before God. And we've talked pretty extensively about that in the last two chapters. You know, Chapter 3, verse 24 tells us that we are justified freely by His grace. Verse 28 tells us that we are justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. Chapter 4 extensively shows us how that Abraham was justified by faith without works and how he's our example of justification. And the end of the chapter, verse 25, says that, he would, that Christ was raised again for our justification. And here we're told that we are justified by the blood of Christ. That is his, his death, his shed blood, is what took away sins, is what made us just before God. It's really what makes us innocent in the sight of God is Christ's death on the cross and taking upon our sin and removing it from us. Amen. And his resurrection is what, I could say, it confirms it, it seals it, it makes it sure that our justification is eternal before God. Amen. So here we are told that by the blood, by his blood we are now justified. And he shed his blood there on the cross and we know in the space of that time that he was in the grave he went and applied it to the mercy seat which is in heaven. And he really became what the Bible calls a propitiation for our sins. Amen. That is, he became the satisfying sacrifice before God. That it is by his shed blood that we can now stand before God without the guilt of sin. You know, the book of Hebrews tells us without the shed of blood there is no remission of sins. Amen. It also tells us in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin forever. But Christ and his perfect sacrifice took away our sins forever there on the cross. Mm -hmm. So now we are justified in his sight. And I think it's no mistake here that the scripture is worded this way that it says being now justified by his blood. But we were not just simply once justified and left to ourselves to maintain that state of innocence. You know, we are, he says, now justified. We are now and forever justified in the sight of God. Amen. You know, just as sure as when Paul wrote it, 
or when salvation came to you personally or even 100 years from now, you can be sure if you're one of his, you are justified in the sight of God through Christ. It will still be true in eternity future, just as much as it is now. But he says, being justified by his blood, he says, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That is, through Christ we shall be saved, delivered, rescued. Those are all the other uses of that word. That we shall be saved. He says, through wrath, or from wrath, through him. Amen. Well, this is just as sure as salvation itself that we shall be saved from wrath. But we we see that first the sin problem had to be dealt with, didn't it? Mm -hmm. right. He said, because we are justified now, we shall be saved from wrath. Because Christ has removed that sin from us, because we are made right in the sight of God, he said, now one of the effects of that is that we shall be saved from wrath from him. I think that's where a lot of people forget or miss the point that sin has to be dealt with first and foremost. Amen. You can desire to go to heaven all you want to, but if your sin has not been dealt with, then you are not going to go there. That's right. You're right. You can fear hell all that you want, but if your sin has not been dealt with, then you are still on your way there. Just the same, you can be a, as good of a person as you desire to be and try to be. And you can go to church every time doors are open. You can give all your money to the poor. You can You'll be a good, obedient citizen and all these different things, but if your sin has not been dealt with, then you are still not saved. Amen. That's right. You're right. Well, that's where salvation begins, is dealing with the sin problem, if you will. You know, it extends much more than that, as we see here. But what did the angel tell Mary? And he shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. That sin was what Christ, first and foremost, came to, to deal with and take care of. And all these other things flow from that. If we are still in our sins, then we are still hopeless and helpless in the sight of God. Amen. And though he's just as sure as he came to save us from sin, though we are saved, he said we shall be also saved from wrath. This wrath here means anger or indignation. It implies the, the punishment that comes with that as well. Man, man's wrath is often driven by emotions and feelings, but God, his wrath is righteous. His, his wrath is pure, if you will. Amen. Yes, God is angry with the wicked every day, the scriptures say. Yet it also says that he is long suffering and patient towards us. One day he will fully pour out his wrath upon us. You're right. I think we see little glimpses of it here and there throughout the scriptures. And certainly. Even hell today is a, a piece of that wrath. But let's go back to John chapter 3. I want to look at a few places about his wrath. <coughs> because we've been justified, he says, we have been saved from this wrath. In John chapter 3, verse 36. Conversation with Nicodemus. We hear, we see John, I think it is John the Baptist, talking with some of the Jews, and he says, He believeth that he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Amen. Any that are not saved, they're not believers, they're not in Christ, whatever term you want to use, they are under the wrath of God. They are, as it says earlier in this chapter, that they are under the condemnation of God. Verse 18, Christ speaking to Nicodemus, he says, but he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. 
He, God does not have to condemn you. Your sin is already done on it. Right. Apparently you will stand before him and he will judge you. If you're not saved, you will be judged by those your works and your sins, and you will be found very lacking and cast in the lake of fire one day. You can be sure God's not going to say, well, I don't like you. I'm going to condemn you. No, sin is what condemns you. You're, ultimately, the sin of unbelief is what condemns all of the lost. Amen. It's that sin that has you in a place of under God's wrath even now. And before the Lord saved us, we were in that place just the same. And you're right. Left to ourselves, we would have continued in condemnation under the wrath of God. One day, we would have to face the full wrath of God. But yet, because He has saved us, we are also saved from that wrath, He says. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many today that desire to be saved from the wrath to come, but not... They don't really care if they're saved from their sin or not. Right. Yeah. You can't have one without the other. Right. There you go. In fact, I didn't write in my notes, but when John was baptizing, before Christ started his ministry, the Pharisees and Sadducees came unto him to be baptized. He said, Who did warn you to flee the wrath to come? He said, Bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. Right. Well, they just wanted that get out of hell free card. There you go. And that's how I'm afraid many people want today. No sin has to be dealt with first. And then, because our sin is dealt with, now we are free from the wrath that is to come. Amen. Let's we'll turn with Colossians for a moment. The book of Colossians, chapter 3. Paul kind of says it even more plainly there that sin is the cause of God's wrath. If I can keep going past it. Colossians chapter number 3 verses 5 and 6. Here, says, here he's given us a command to say, he says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, and inordinate affection, evil Concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things say the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Amen. And here Paul tells us that we need to get rid of these sins because that is what brings the wrath of God upon the unsaved, or as he calls them here, the children of disobedience. He said sin is what brings the wrath of God. That's why sin must be dealt with for us to be delivered from the wrath to come. Mm -hmm. 1 Thessalonians 1 10 tells us that Christ has delivered us from the wrath that is to come. 1 Thessalonians 1 10 says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he had raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Mm -hmm. So that is the promise for us that are saved that we have been delivered from that wrath. That we're not going to once again fall into it. And it's not that we have to hope that. When we get to heaven, he's not going to tell us to go down below. That's how many are depicted today, though, isn't it? Right. You could have stand before the pearly gate, and mm. Peter, for whatever reason, is going to see if your name's on the list. <laughs> and if it's not, you get to go down to hell. That's not how it works. All right. No, either Christ has delivered you from your sin and from the wrath to come, or you are still in your sin and still under the wrath of God. That's it. There's no purgatory to go work it out in the meantime. The more I study Romans, the more I study, or I wouldn't say study, the more I read about Catholic theology, the more I see that the, everything that the book of Romans teaches is in contrast to what they teach. You're right. The justification by faith, as Paul dwelt on for quite a long time, they reject that and say, you have to be justified by other things, by works. That's it. And they say, yes, faith is a part of it, but you also have to be justified by works as well. You know, when it comes to this teaching here, the, us being delivered from the wrath of, to come, the wrath of God, well, they say that 
you can ultimately fall once again into the wrath of God. They say that they basically teach that Christ's sacrifice is not sufficient to deliver us from that. Right. Because well, ultimately because they don't believe in justification by faith in Christ alone. That's right. Amen. So then you have to do enough good works to keep yourself from being falling back under the wrath of God. And that's why they invented this thing called purgatory where you can go and work it out. Yeah. Somehow you can atone for your sins there and make your way to heaven. We know either Christ has saved us from that wrath to come or we will be under the wrath. There's only there's only those two options. Yeah. I want to turn to Revelation and look at a couple verses here. Like I said, I think we see little glimpses of the wrath of God, especially in the Old Testament. Revelation chapter 6, though, we really begin to see the wrath of God being poured out. You know, when Korah and his crew were just swallowed up in the earth, that, that was a, a glimpse of the wrath of God. And mm-hmm. Fire and brimstone rained down from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a glimpse of the wrath of God. Surely the flood of Noah's day, that was the wrath of God upon the old world. Revelation 6, verse 15 through 17. Another reason why I don't think we as saved will go through a literal seven year tribulation period. We, there's lots of debates about whether it's seven years or whether it's figurative or whether we shall go through it or whether we shall not. But I don't think we will endure it because it is the pouring out of the wrath of God upon this world. Right. Verse 15 of Revelation 6 says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to them, Said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, who shall be able to stand? Amen. Yeah. Here we begin to see God pouring his wrath upon this world. And we know there's the, the vials are open and the scrolls are open and all these other things are done when he shall judge this world. That's why I said we, Thessalonians in another place says we are not appointed in the wrath to, to obtain salvation. Amen. In verse four, or excuse me, chapter 14, I think describes the culmination of God's wrath. Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. It says, And the third angel follows him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark into his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Here it is, in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and their smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the image of we worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Amen. That is the, the culmination, if you will, of the wrath of God when he, when all those who are not saved, all those who worship the beast, as it says here, all the beast itself, and the devil and the false prophet are all cast in the lake of fire and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever, it says, and shall be Separate and apart from his presence. Mm-hmm. We, I think we'll be able to look out there and see that that are those that are saved, but the scriptures have described the lake of fire as a place of darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right. So that's fulfilled in chapter end of chapter 19, beginning of chapter 20, I think it is. We don't have to turn and read that, but the great white throne and the dead stand before God and they are judged out of the books. And right. All those who are not found in the Lamb's Book of Life are cast in the lake of fire, along with, like I said, the devil, the false prophet, and the beast. Even as death and hell are described as being cast into that place. Right. 
eternal torments and separation from the presence of God. That is where the wrath of God ultimately culminates in. Mm -hmm. And that is what awaits all those who are under his wrath. So there's not, it's not there's going to be some purgatory and you're going to work your way out. You know it. It's not that you're going to stand before God and hope your good works outweigh your bad ones. No, it's either Christ has delivered you from your sin and from the wrath to come, or you are still in your sin and still under the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to our text in Romans. See, there's so much more salvation than just Christ died for us. Amen. That's the basis where it starts, but it goes out to so much more than that that we ought to be eternally thankful to him for all that comes through salvation. You know, but after he tells us that we are we shall be saved from the wrath through him or from wrath through Christ, you notice he says we shall be saved. There's no if ands or buts about it. If you're one of his you'll be saved. Amen. If you've truly been saved or justified in the sight of God now, you will be saved from that wrath through Christ. Verse 10, though, he goes on to give us a, another one here. Uh, it says, for if, Paul gives another illustration of what Christ has done for us. Here he's using a, an if-then statement. If Christ has done this, then surely he will do that. He says, if when we were enemies, that should almost going to be a scary thought for us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. At one time, we were enemies of God. And for the unsaved, you are still the enemies of God. But we were at enmity with Him. We were literally in opposition to God Himself. So we were breakers of His law, transgressors of His commandments, and all those. We were sinners in His sight, unholy, unrighteous, unworthy of any good, yet when we were in that state, not only did he provide everything needed for our salvation, he brought it to pass as well. For if when we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God, this reconciled means that we were returned to favor with God, or it can mean to bring back into a relationship with God. And accounting is to bring two accounts back into agreement. Mm -hmm. I'm sure most of y'all know, but people my age and younger don't do this anymore. Before electronic banking, you had to write everything down in your checkbook. When you got to the end of the month, you made sure it matched up with what the bank had. You, right. If it didn't, you had to reconcile it. You had to bring those two back into agreement. That's mm -hmm. really what Christ did for us with God. He brought us back into a place of agreement with God. That's it. As the Song says the old account was large and growing every day. It should. And, you know, our account against God was really innumerable, and yet we were reconciled back to God. We were brought back into favor with God. So we were really unfavorable. We were not only were we not worthy of his grace, we were demerited, if you will, in his sight. And yet it says we were reconciled to God. We were brought back into favor with him through the death of Christ. As it says here, by the death of his son, it was by the death of Christ that we were able to be brought back into this favor with God. And it was because Christ took upon our sin and gave us his righteousness that we were able to be brought back into this agreeable state with God again. Amen. As if you are familiar with the whole of the scriptures, we were one time in an agreeable state with God, weren't we? As mankind, we were in full fellowship without sin in the sight mm -hmm. at the beginning. Yet in Adam, we lost it all, didn't we? That's it. That is why one reason why Christ is described as the second Adam is to bring us back into that original state with God. We are in Christ. We are in full agreement with God. We are in full 
peace with God. We are in full favor with God. Amen. That's why, once again, you can't have this wishy-washy place. You're either in favor with God or you're outside of this favor. That's you're, it. You're either an enemy of God or you're his child and in good standing before him. Mm -hmm. But it was by the death of Christ that this was made even possible. Not only so, it was by his death that he brought us back into this place because without taking care of the sin problem, once again, we could not be right before God. Without taking care of what originally separated us from God, which was sin, then we would not be able to be back in this place of agreement with God. Mm -hmm. All the way back in the garden, it was sin that separated us, severed that relationship with God. It had to be dealt with. That's just one more reason why the Old Testament saints could not go into the presence of God as of yet, right, until Christ died. Well, they had their sins covered. They had a they had a sacrifice for sin, but they didn't have one that could fully take it away. That's it. It was by the death of his son that we were reconciled once again to God. But he goes on to say, much more being reconciled is because we have been reconciled, how much more shall God do for us? If he did that while we were at enmity with him, while we were the enemies of God, how much more shall he do for us now that we are in agreement with him? Right? Amen. In that place of recon being reconciled to him. He says, because of that, we shall be saved by his life. We know that Christ is alive forevermore, Revelation 118. Amen. And again, he ever live at the making intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25. And it's because he ever lives, it's because he is he which was alive and was dead and is alive forevermore. It's because of his life that we have complete confidence that we shall have eternal life in him. It's because not only were we once saved, but we shall be saved in the end as well. Amen. Well, because he lives, we shall see the fullness of our salvation come to pass. And I know I've said this before, but that's what separates Christianity from other religions of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, Muhammad is in a grave somewhere, we is in a grave somewhere. But our Savior, he lives forevermore in the, at the right hand of God. Because that, he is really the only one that is able to offer eternal life. I know other religions offer some form of eternal life, but yet only the risen Savior can really offer that. He's the only one who's ever defeated death. Right. Because he lives, we shall be saved. Because he is not still dead somewhere, we have full assurance that he shall give us eternal life. And I know in one sense we already possess eternal life, and in another sense, We'll have full realization of that at the resurrection when we shall put on that immortality and we shall put on that indestructible body. Amen. That one that's not been tainted by sin. So God has done so much for us already, even when we were still in the state of being enemies with him. Mm -hmm. How much more shall he do for us? How much more shall we receive from his hand now that we are in favor with him once again? Now. And yet we sometimes act like if we don't live just perfectly, then God's not going to favor us. And there's some that they teach it. Yeah, God saves you, but if you, could, if you don't live without sin in your life, then you're going to ultimately be lost again. Mm. That's not the salvation that Paul is teaching us about here. You're right. God did not just once justify us and leave it up to us to justify ourselves the rest of the time. He didn't just save us from sin and say, well, I hope it all works out in the end. 
He didn't just reconcile us at the beginning and say, well, you've got to maintain that relationship. And he didn't just die for our sins and then not promise and really not sec- <laughs> He didn't just die for our sins and not secure that he shall bring salvation fully to pass. It's because he lives that we know that Amen. one day we will be forever with him. And if Christ was still in the grave, we would, and Corinthians said very plainly, that we'd be of all men most miserable. We'd still be in our sins. Our faith would be in vain. Those that had died in Christ would have perished. But because he ever lives, we shall ever live with him. Amen. That's why he, it says here, we, being reconciled, we shall be saved. Certainly we are saved now in the present tense, but we shall be saved in the future as well. We, we didn't leave it up to us to keep our salvation. He didn't leave it up to us to, to maintain our justification. He didn't leave it up to us to maintain that state of favor with God. But in Christ, it is secure for all eternity. Mm-hmm. Also, we didn't, it's not that Christ saved us and then he can one day lose us again. You can be sure that he says, we shall be saved, that we shall be saved. Mm-hmm. Not, once again, it's not a hope, so if maybe but salvation, but we are eternally secure in the hand of Christ and then doubly secure in the hand of God the Father. Mm-hmm. We shall be saved. It should be a very reassuring thought to the child of God that we that Christ is able to save us to the uttermost. That, as Paul said in another place, that He which has begun a good work in us will perform it in the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that not only was Christ able to save us? He was able. He is able to keep us. That's safe. right. And while we say all of that, we'll see you later in the chapter, and especially in chapter six. None of that frees us from our service for God. That's it. But in the sight of God, it is Christ who, who saved us and who keeps us saved, and who gives us all these benefits of salvation. Therefore, we, because of that, we ought to serve Him. Because of all that He has done for us, we ought to. Strive to do exactly what he has told us to do. Amen. But oh, we ought to give God through the Lord Jesus Christ great thanks for all that he has done for us. I'm going to close with that thought. Amen.